So don't forget to complete the weekend vocab quiz by Sunday. Um, and for next week, uh, we're going to be reading uh, the first half of George Orwell's The Road to Wigan Here. Now, I know this sounds like a lot larger reading assignment than I usually give you, but um, one thing I'm going to note about this is that this book is a lot easier to read than a lot of what we've been looking at. The language is a lot less um, gnarly. Um, the imagery is a lot less dense. It's, it's a nonfiction book. And also the print is quite large. Um, so it should, it, it's you know, equivalent to maybe about you know, 40 pages of you know, somebody like Wolf. Um, and one thing that we're gonna see as we look at these next couple of writers, so we're going from Yeats to um, George Orwell to W.H. Auden and to Louis McNeese. Right, so we've been kind of like <clears throat> playing in the gardens of high modernism lately. So we have these writers like Eliot, Yeats, and Joyce, or not Joyce, uh, Wolf, who are kind of consciously experimental And at least in the case of Eliot and Yeats, um, also kind of right wing in their politics. And uh, as you probably noticed with the reading for today, um, as Yeats gets older, his conservatism hardens into something that is much closer to what we would now uh, recognize as fascism. Now, <clears throat> the 30s writers we're going to be looking at starting next week. Orwell, Auden, and McNeese. Write with a less um, quote unquote highbrow audience in mind and are also uh, more leftist in their politics. None of them are completely doctrinaire leftists. Um, they all have uh, issues with the party line in some sense. But yeah, politically, they are well to the left of these earlier high modernist writers. They're also about a generation younger though they are definitely influenced by Eliot and Yeats, particularly Auden and McNeese. So are they progressives or more liberal? Um, I would say, well, I, um, they, they would be, at least in the 30s, when they're still young men, uh, they would be what we would call democratic socialists, primarily. Right? So, so you know, they, they are in favor of a democratic state with free speech and individual rights guaranteed, but a centrally controlled economy. Um, <clears throat> Auden is briefly affiliated with the British Communist Party, but doesn't last long um, there. And Orwell actually does go to fight on behalf of the socialist government in Spain in the 1930s. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so the, the, yeah, their politics are quite different from that older generation. Although you know, Wolf, um, we noted, uh, is part of that kind of center-left Bloomsbury group, who would be equivalent today to kind of like limousine liberals. Um, so let's get back to Yeats here. These are some of the last things that Yeats uh, wrote before he died. What did you think of them? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to start. <laughs> I thought the the perpetrator story, or whatever, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it was like oh, it. it was definitely strange. It okay. was weird, but I, yeah, I could see like the underlying message that he was trying to convey. Okay. About. 
like since I'm declining and uh -huh. stuff like that is what I got from it. Okay. And then um, on the boiler, kind of seeing like the same thing, like society declining, like only the rich people are going to succeed. Um, uh huh. That's what I got. There, there is a eugenic edge to it. Yes. And mm -hmm. I believe, like by the end, when he want, when he kills his own son, I, th I think it's to preserve his uh, purity, like his mother, like mm -hmm. his mother's purity, who died yeah. before she could be uh, corrupted. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. I kind of saw, um, like I saw that stuff as well. Uh -huh. But I also kind of got a vibe of the son paying for the sins of the father because the old man's paying for his father's sins. Uh -huh. And then now his son is paying for his own sins because he killed his father in an attempt to ease the suffering of his mother's spirit. Uh -huh. Instead caused more suffering. Had a son and feels that caused him even more and is now trying to fix it. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and his proposed solution to the problem. Murder. Yeah, is to kill the degenerate son. It right? fixes everything. Yeah, and thus end that cycle of reproduction, right? <clears throat> but does it work? No. No. Yeah, ultimately, it doesn't fix or change anything, right? Everything's still stuck where it was. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I thought that, um, like, at the end, after he killed him, uh -huh. also, that, like, he thought... After that, like his mom and stuff, like would be laid to rest. Yeah. That's what I got to. I don't know if we kind of said that, but uh huh. I, I don't know. This poem was meant to be done in a theater, right? Because it's got theater yes. directions. Yes, and that's actually one of the things we haven't discussed too much about Yeats yet. Is that um, he's best known as a poet, but theater was also a big part of his life and was arguably his day job. So. Um, Yeats is one of the founders in the 1890s of the Irish Literary Theatre. And the Irish Literary Theatre is a group um, of like-minded playwrights. Um, it initially included, in addition to Yeats, his friend and patroness Lady Gregory, The Irish language scholar and folklorist Douglas Hyde, the playwright Edward Martin, and Martin's cousin George Moore, who was primarily a novelist but also wrote for the theater. And this group uh, splits apart uh, fairly early. And Yeats and Gregory go on to found another group. It's a, this is actually an, an organization that still exists, uh, the Abbey Theater. And the Abbey Theater is today the National Theater of Ireland. It's a state-run it's, it's state institution. Um, and yeah, their, their theater building um, is um, look at one of the most prominent um, pieces of architecture in North Dublin. And that was, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that was built on Lady Gregory's estate. Uh, no, Lady Gregory's estate is actually in Galway. Mm. Um, oh, I, so, I, meant, I meant with her money. Oh, 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 partly with her money. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yates, Yates did a lot of things with rich women's money. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, if you can make it work, make it work. But yeah, um, Lady Gregory and one of his Golden Dawn. Compatriots, a woman by the name of Annie Horniman, who was kind of like, just as um, Yeats was kind of unrequitedly in love with Maud Gunn, Annie Horniman was kind of unrequitedly in love with Yeats and kept lavishing money on his theater projects. The problem was she usually wanted to be creatively involved and uh, didn't really have that talent. So she would want to contribute things like costume designs and, you know, the, the figures in the play would end up looking but because it's her money, you know, it's, that makes sense. yeah, really absolutely. We win some, we lose some. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so what the Abbey did was like create a distinctively Irish style 
of production um, and content, right? So it focused on English language plays. But again, with that kind of specifically Irish content. So you had, you know, peasant dramas written mostly by Lady Gregory and J.M. Singh. And Yeats's own plays were often um, mythological. You can probably guess which of these two types was more popular with audiences. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of Yeats's stuff um, tends to tended to go over the heads of um, the Abbey's early audiences, and even like today, like a lot of it reads well as poetry, but doesn't really work all that well in performance. But Yeats was also the stage manager and artistic director of the Abbey Theatre. So he made a lot of decisions about what went on on that stage. And the Abbey actors created a distinctive style of acting, um, whereas, um, it, which was decidedly kind of like non-naturalistic. So, right, so the norm in English language and European theatre generally in the early, 19, in the early 1900s was um, a kind of fidelity to realism. Right, you wanted to bring you, know, you wanted audiences to believe in the world of the play, and you wanted them, um, you know, to believe that the characters on the stage were simulations of real people. Right, so you know, think about you know a play like Candide. Right, you know, those play, all the characters are stand-ins for ideas, and some of them are kind of parodies of stock types, but they also come off as being similar to like believable people. So it had to be just conventional enough and not too modern for a general <laughs> audience to understand. Probably, yeah, that would probably what a, yeah, what a general audience would be going for, yeah, yeah. Although Shaw is also aiming a little bit higher. But um, the Abbey actors, um, all of whom were initially amateurs, right? They didn't start out as a professional company. Um, created a style of acting um, that was much more kind of stylized, right? So you know, big expansive gestures, um, standing still when speaking, and they were kind of deliberately trying. Even in these kind of peasant plays, they were deliberately trying to undermine um, the norms of English language theater in this period. Now there's another thing that Yeats is doing in this play. This is an influence that comes in a little bit later. Um, but it, it's a huge influence on the plays of the latter half of his career. Um, do any of you know what no theater is? You'll find it spelled N-O-H or N-O with a slash over it. Have any of you ever heard of this? Okay, so no theater is a Japanese dramatic form. So it evolves from a combination of traditional religious rituals and court dances in the 14th century. And no theater is aristocratic in its orientation in just about all senses of the word, right? So it was sponsored by the samurai class it was intimately connected with the culture of the Japanese court. And it tended to celebrate the
the particular values of the Japanese aristocracy, right? It was also aimed pretty, pretty squarely at aristocratic audiences, right? This was play, that, this is a, a style of drama that was not really for the masses. It was directly aimed at the upper classes. Um, and here's what it looks like, right? What you typically get in the play. So they're usually based on stories from history and mythology. So no playwrights usually did not invent their own plots, much like the ancient Greek playwrights typically dealt with traditional materials. It's performed on a bare stage with musical accompaniment. The costumes and the acting style are non-naturalistic, and all the performers wear masks. And the masks usually indicate character types in some way. So, for example, you know, there's you know there'll be a type of mask for a samurai character, a type of mask that indicates a god, a type of mask that indicates um, a woman, or a demon, or a ghost, or whatever, right? And demons and ghosts do pop up in these plays a lot. They're also incredibly slow moving. So one of the best known no plays is called Atsumori. It's written by Zayami. And Atsumori is about six pages of text. Guess how long it takes to perform. Yes, <laughs> that's actually correct because like much of what happens in the play is dance and chanting, right? The plot does not resolve itself quickly. In a lot of ways, these plays are more about motion and not like fast whirling motion, but slow, controlled, patient motion. Um, over resolving an action quickly, right? So these are plays that move very, very, very slowly. And Yeats adopts um, several of these features in his, own, in his own plays in the latter half of his career, even those that are explicitly based on Irish mythology. Now one other thing that we often see in no plays, they tend to have a kind of explicitly Buddhist spiritual message. So oftentimes, um, the, the characters in the play are kind of stuck in whatever their horrible situation is because of some lingering attachment in the material world, right? Like the basic, you know, I'm way oversimplifying um, Buddhist spirituality here, right? But the basic idea that underlies most forms of Buddhism is that suffering in this world is caused by our attachment to the world. And in order to achieve salvation, what we have to do is try to detach ourselves as much as possible from the world. You know, that's, you know, detach, whether that's you know, detaching ourselves from material objects or human relationships or whatever. So usually a, a no play is in some way about kind of getting a character out of this cycle of suffering that's, that's built on attachment. 
And I think we can see that kind of influence in a play like Purgatory. So does anybody have any questions about this so far? Take a minute, sit with it for a second. And I want you to see if you can kind of apply this idea to this, like any of these ideas to this play. Where do you see no influence? Well, the whole storyline is based on history, something that happened in the past, so like their own okay. personal history. Mm -hmm. There's not really much going on in the setting. There's a tree uh -huh. and a white background. And there's mention of a frame of a house barely standing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have an almost bare set here, right? It's pretty slow to go. Uh huh. And it kind of has the Buddhist idea because this guy is set or stuck in his own situation, the old man is, because he's unable to let go of his mother in his past and what happened to his mother. Okay. So we can see, at least in the old man's situation, that kind of connection to materiality, right? That causes suffering. And then the boy is connected to money. Yeah. He's very, very upset about not getting his money so he can spend it on drinks and girls, which he doesn't necessarily <laughs> say he's going to do, uh -huh. but when it's gone out there, he's like, and so what if I do? Yeah. So and we I, can assume that he mm -hmm. And. One thing to point out here, too, is like, I think what we're talking about Yeats coming from a position closer to the old man's, but does he actually give the boy some ammunition, some good ammunition against the old man? Like, are the boy's arguments entirely unreasonable? No. Yeah. Yeah. It's like seeing things. Uh huh. Yeah the, yeah, the boy doesn't see until near the end, right? What the old man sees. He is not, he is not seeing the ghosts in the house. But I remember the boy saying something about how the money should have been his, or he should have gotten partial part yeah. of money, or something like that. So. Yeah, let's go, to, let's go to page 172. Right? As the old man is kind of looking at the house and watching the ghosts, right? Just come back, come back. And so you thought to slip away my bag of money between your fingers, and that I could not talk and see. You have been rummaging in the pack. And the boy responds, you never gave me my right share. And had I given it, young as you are, you would have spent it on drink. What if I did? I have a right to get it and spend it as I chose. So on the one hand here, we have gener it's a kind of typical generational conflict, right? The father doesn't want to give the son his allowance because he's afraid of what the boy is going to spend it on, right? But this is also, I think, connected to the racial anxieties that Yeats expresses in On the Boiler, right? Um, his anxieties particularly about the future of Ireland. So I'm going to give you another kind of historical digression here that kind of tells us how Yeats comes by this political position. And then we'll see if we can fit this into On the Boiler and, and the play. So Ireland, or at least the 26 counties that make up the Republic of Ireland today, achieves its independence from the United Kingdom in 1922. Right? So Yates is appointed to serve in the Irish Senate, which he does from 1922 to 1928. Now, um, in parliamentary systems, like the one in Ireland and like the one that it's modeled on in the United Kingdom, uh, the upper house doesn't actually do very much. Um, 
pretty much all legislation happens in the lower house, right? So, you know, um, the House of Commons generates bills in Britain, right? And the House of Lords pretty much just kind of like, sits there drinking tea. You know, they, they get their positions through hereditary peerage rather than through being elected. Now, Irish senators are elected or appointed, but it's still the, the same kind of thing, right? Um, you know, they have kind of like debates on cultural matters and things of that nature. They don't usually produce much actual legislation or have much actual impact on legislation. You know, Yates is appointed to the Senate mostly because he's a big, important cultural figure, right? It's a, a kind of, you know, reward for being so active in Irish cultural life. They appointed a lot of, like, Irish artists and writers, like, in the Senate. Oh yeah. I just noticed that like while I was like looking into like gates and stuff, it was like every person that he knew got put in the Senate. Yeah. Which yeah. I feel like could have been a mistake. But. And yeah, and when I think some of that is also a class issue, which we'll get to in a moment as well. Um, that a lot of Yeats's compatriots in art and literature also come from that Anglo Irish ascendancy class. But there are two big things that Yeats does. On the one hand, he helps to decide on a design for Irish coinage. The other big thing that he does in the Senate is in 1925. He takes part in debates over a bill that would outlaw divorce in Ireland. Now, this divorce bill was being pushed heavily uh, by the Irish hierarchy of the, of the Catholic Church, right? Essentially, they wanted government policy to hew as closely as possible to um, church policy. Now, Yates, being a Protestant, you know, being a Protestant, and being um, a member of, you know, thus a minority in the Irish population, although a relatively privileged minority, um, sees this as part of a kind of like coming siege against his particular cultural group. Right now that the Catholics are in charge of things. They're going to start making life diff. They're essentially going to start exacting revenge on Protestants who ran things for so long, right? And they're going to make us obey their church's particular rules. So he gives a speech, and the speech he gives in the divorce debate is itself kind of racially tinged, right? He argues that his people, the Anglo-Irish ascendancy, are one of the great stocks of Europe. And you know, he gives a list of these kind of important figures. He comes to worship, in particular, these 18th century ascendancy figures like Edmund Burke, Jonathan Swift, George Barclay, the poet Oliver Goldsmith. Now, have any of you heard of any of these people? Burke, Burke. Swift. I've heard of Oliver Goldsmith. Okay, yes. Goldsmith. Goldsmith. Yeah, Goldsmith's a poet, right? Burke was a, a politician and philosopher. Um, Swift is the Gulliver's Travels guy, right? Also wrote um, reams and reams of stuff about poop. Um, <clears throat> I'm guessing if there's not any matter, it's probably George Barclay, right? So Barclay was an empiricist philosopher who argued that um, there's no such thing as matter, right? That <clears throat> everything that exists exists because we are currently perceiving it. Can we talk about this in your level one? 
We probably did, yeah. I mean, Berlitz, sorry. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I wouldn't be so, like, I actually really like talking about this because the idea just seems so batshit. But it's also hard to argue against. I may be remembering wrong, but I remember you talking about this theory kind of like that, where uh -huh. like, the table doesn't actually exist unless you're like, thinking about it and, like, yeah. it. That's ba <laughs> that's basically Barclay's idea. So I have no evidence that this room exists or that any of you exist when I'm not in here teaching this class, right? If I am not directly perceiving you, I have no evidence that you are not a figment of my imagination. That guy's fun. <laughs> yeah. What was he on? <laughs> What's that? What was he on? Well, I stuff. I would like them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, like he, he kind of gives himself an out here by saying that everything in the world is kind of simultaneously perceived within the mind of God, but that kind of sounds to me like a cop out. Yeah. I mean, the the, the original idea, and not it, like it, it, enough, is it, like it's you know it, it's bizarre, but it's hard to disprove, right? Because of course I can't prove that you exist if I'm not perceiving you. It was probably cooler, uh, probably a crazier idea to them back in the day. Mm -hmm. I, know, I, I know you get that term. Back in the day. <laughs> um, in the 18th century. <laughs> just anything Plato blew people's minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so Yeats develops this kind of pantheon of 18th century ascendancy thinkers. Like he kind of regards these people as the apex of Anglo Irish cultural achievement. And that everything since has been a kind of falling off. So as he is becoming more and more fascinated with 18th century Ireland, particularly 18th century Protestant Ireland, he is also moving closer and closer to um, authoritarian movements in Ireland, right? These kind of hit Ireland in the 1920s and 1930s just as they're hitting every place else in Europe, right? And the form they take in Ireland is a group called the Army Comrades Association. Popularly known as the Blue Shirts. So the Army Comrades Association um, is a group made up mostly of former IRA men who had fought in the War of Independence um, who protect meetings of the more conservative political party. They're not officially part of it until they're absorbed a little later on. Um, but yeah, that their you know their practices are very similar to you know Hitler's brown shirts in Germany and Mussolini's black shirts in Italy, right? In fact, like it seems like every fascist group in the 30s had a shirt color. But yeah, it's this like is pre-K field day. What's that? It's like pre-K field day when they give all the classrooms different colors and they can meet. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if, if pre-K field day was made up pretty much entirely of, um, of authoritarian thugs in uniform. Yeah, I mean, I mean pre-Kers are very close to that. <laughs> Children are like little, they're going to rule the world one day. If they wanted yeah. to, they could take us all out. I mean, no, ch 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 children are tiny sociopaths. Yes. That I will yes. yeah. agree with. The image of just like all of like the authoritarian leaders being like, what color do you want? Uh -huh. I wanted that color. It's very, yeah, it's like that's yeah, a little. We're brown, in a fight brown, to the death. Well, brown and black are taken, so I guess we'll be blue. Yes. But yeah, they, they, they're, they're called blue shirts because they wore blue uniforms. Um, and their leader was a guy by the name of Owen O'Duffy, who was at the time he was leading this group, also the police, the Ireland, Ireland's police commissioner. So he ran the police force in Ireland, the national police force, but he was also leading this fascist group. And Yates goes so far as to write um, a couple of marching songs for the Blue Shirts, which they never end up using. 
And eventually he um, dissociates himself from them because he regards O'Duffy as kind of a clown. Um, and what's that? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, to, to be fair, O'Duffy kind of is a clown. Um, you know, he, he falls out of favor with the governing party and then tries to cut all kinds of deals with other fascist governments in Europe. Um, he is last heard of in the 40s um, trying to forge an alliance between former Irish Republicans and the Nazis. So, well, wasn't he a lovely little man? Yeah. But yeah, yeah he, he, he and Yates, um, Yates never particularly respected O'Duffy, but he was interested in the movements. Although O'Duffy's movement also was predominantly Catholic, which turned Yates off as well. He didn't kind of see a place for himself or for Protestant thinkers um, in it. And you know, there's another thing that might also have been um, influencing a lot of Yeats's thoughts, but this is actually a geographic, like a, not a geographical, an architectural thing. So we talked last time, you mentioned, uh, Sam, the tarot card, the tower, and, that's and that, that card's importance to Yeats. But Yeats's poem, The Tower, isn't just about that card. It's about a literal tower. He lived in a tower oh, nice. from 1921 to 1929. So he purchased a tower in Galway called Tor Valley League in 1916. And he occupied it with his family from 1921 to 1929. So this, when he was doing those automatic writing experiments, this is one of the primary places he was doing them. <laughs> well, amazing. <laughs> not a witch tower necessarily, but it was um, a 15th century Norman tower. Now, that's gold right there. Yeah. I mean, you know, when he uh, when he bought it, it was in pretty sad shape, pretty bad condition. So it took him about five years to, you know, modernize it, get you know, running water, modern plumbing, electricity into the place, um, you know, fix the roof, all that, you know, make it habitable. But yeah, um, he lived there off and on then from 1921 to 1929. Interesting how he bought a Norman tower when the Normans were probably killing the Celts all across Ireland. But, um, well, you know, and I think you know, the, the relationship between the Normans and the native Irish is actually kind of a little bit more complicated than that. Mm. The Normans are actually in, arguably invited into Ireland in the 13th century by one king who'd been deposed by another king. There was no unified Irish government in the 13th century. There were a couple of small warring kingdoms. And yeah, so... The king of Leinster in Eastern Ireland uh, summoned the, some of the Normans over to come and help him take his kingdom back from a rival. So it was political. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. What's the word? It wasn't just an invasion or free for all. It, it wasn't was imperialism. It was. It, yeah. Well. It, it, yeah. It, well, imperialism <laughs> on the Irish side, <laughs> not imperialism on the French side. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's. Yeah. Um. It's complicated. But one thing to note is that the Normans stuck around in Ireland. And in fact, like any Irish person whose last name starts with that prefix fits, that's not Irish, that's actually Norman. Mm. Maybe he just couldn't find another tower that he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but I, I think what like a lot of weird things for a lot of really unexplainable reasons. Uh huh. Just but I think, what, what, like, like the idea of a tower too. It's like, what, 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 like, why do you build a tower? Like, why does somebody build a tower? Look out to see. Look out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So, so it, give, it gives you the, the wide view of the countryside, right? Why do you need the wide view of the countryside in a tower? For defense. For defense, exactly. Yeah, a tower is a defensive structure. I would have lived. 
Yeah, um, a tower is something that you occupy when you feel like you are under siege. I mean, if my wife was inviting spirits into her every night to write me stuff, I would also feel under siege, <laughs> just personally. Yeah, well, they're, you know, well, so inviting that, spirits, so. yeah. He's a that, so. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, he mm -hmm. was an interesting dude. But, he did a lot of interesting things. <laughs> oh, sure. And, you know, he had a lot of interesting opinions. And, like, kind of one of his lifelong opinions um, regarding art was that you don't get, like, bad artists give the people what they want. Right. So an artist who is just making art in order to please an audience, in order to please the masses, isn't really an artist. Wasn't that what he said in On the, the, on on the Boiler? boiler. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And that is, that is actually a, lo like a long-held opinion on Yates' part. So On the Boiler is written in 1939. It's written the year he dies. Um, but that is in itself, like a lot of his conflict with other figures in the Irish theater movement um, and other groups in which he was involved was about, like, you know, should we go for mass appeal, right? Should we try to get the biggest audience we can? Or should we, um, <clears throat> you know, aim for our own artistic satisfaction? And for Yeats, the true artist always aims for that individual satisfaction, like follows his, follows his or her own star and does what he or she thinks is right or best. So what you give the masses is not what they want, but what you think they need or what you think is good for them, which of course comes from your particular individual vision. They, you know, maybe they have to be brought up to speed with that, maybe they have to be brought up to it, and if they don't get it, well, fuck them. But, so, so he's, he's sitting on his proverbial ivory tower. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a good analogy here. It's like you know, the artist is somebody to be approached from below, right? Not somebody who is going to hand down from above um, what the people <clears throat> want, right? They have to come to him. They have to build themselves up in a way that will allow them to understand him, rather than um, you know the other way around. And you know, if if that kind of sounds like um, the attitude of someone who's kind of an asshole, um, that's not, not an inaccurate read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's actually look at on the boiler now, because we can see in this the development of a lot of these long-standing ideas and other kinds of notions that we've talked about with Yeats and with Irish writers as well. So if you look on page 315, at the beginning, he's writing specifically about, like they're kind of at the end of an Abbey Player's tour that's been successful, they've been to the United States. So as I write these words, the Abbey Players are finishing a successful American tour. These tours, and Irish songs and novels, when they come from a deeper life than their 19th century predecessors, are taking the place of political speakers, political organizations, in holding together the 20 scattered millions conscious of their Irish blood. The attitude towards life of Irish writers and dramatists at this moment will have historical importance. So, what does this sound like? Does this sound like any particular discourse we've already talked about? And maybe start to think back to when we first started talking about Yeats. Which I realized was a long time ago. These tours and Irish songs and novels are taking the place of political speakers, political organizations, and holding together the 20 scattered millions conscious of their Irish blood. What concept is he expressing here? Nationalism. 
nationalism, but what kind of nationalism? Yes, exactly. This is that old-fashioned cultural nationalism coming back in, right? Right, the culture and art here are more important to solidifying a sense of national identity than politics are. The success of the Abbey Theater has grown out of the single conviction of its founders. I was the spokesman because I was born arrogant and had learned an artist's arrogance. Not what you want, but what we want. And we were the first modern theater that said it. I did not speak for John Singe, Augusta Gregory, and myself alone, but for all the dramatists of the theater. Again and again, somebody speaking for our audience, for an influential newspaper or political organization, has demanded more of this kind of play or less or none of that. They have not understood that we cannot, and if we would, if we could, would not comply. The moment any dramatist has some dramatic sense and applies it to our Irish theme, he is played. So is there a political attitude that's kind of implied in what Yates is writing here? They have no right to tell them what to do. <laughs> What's that? They, they have no right to like, tell them what they can and can't perform. Okay, yeah. And this actually was a problem for the Abbey Theater. So some, of, some of the plays they put on turned out to be controversial. In particular, a play by J.M. Singe called The Playboy of the Western World um, was believed to paint the rural Irish in a less than flattering light and so caused protests at some of uh, some performances. But um, Hannah, you were about to say something as well. Um, I was pretty much gonna say the same thing. Uh -huh. that, like, they just wanna do what they wanna do and don't wanna be told like, uh -huh. to be different. And even if they were to be told what to do, they still wouldn't listen to anyway, so just like, <laughs> try. Because they wanna give the people what they think like what we were yeah, saying, yeah. Like what they think that uh -huh. needs to be said, not what mm -hmm. they want. Uh-huh. So what kind of politics are implied in this? I just thought, but I'm pretty sure it's wrong. I was going to say anti-authoritarian. Okay. Anti-government. Okay, well, is it anti-government necessarily? Because who, who are they refusing to be told what to do by? It's anti-democratic. Yeah, it's anti-democratic, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, I, mean, I think yeah, you were certainly thinking in the right direction. It was anti, right? But yeah, it's anti-democracy. He wants to be in charge. You can tell from the entire way that he speaks, that entire manner of, I was born arrogant. <laughs> Yeah, and so some, and you know, uh, you can also take that as kind of self-deprecating humor, right? It's like it's like, well, because I, you know, because I was the natural asshole, I was the one who took on this role, right? But yeah, but there's there's truth in it too, right? You know, it works because it's true. Um, That's why it's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of artists have that mentality. Mm -hmm. Well, and and Especially yeah. high schoolers. <laughs> Especially, yeah, not not seventy year old men. <laughs> I'm just happy the end of their lives. Flashbacks to like senior year. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out which one is more tolerable. Yeah. Well, one. I'm gonna pick a seventy year old Gates over thirty year old thinking of. I'm actually I'm gonna play devil's advocate here for the arrogant high schooler because I think the arrogant high schooler's problem is that they lack perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like you, you know, you, you've only you've only been in this world 16, 17 years. Um, you don't have enough experience of it yet um, to have developed a wider view than you know your own needs and desires. At least the eggs went around the block a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's actually writing this from Italy, so yeah. yeah Arrogant high schooler just wanted to say fuck on stage, but <laughs> that was the whole mess. Ah. It wasn't me. I was not a theater kid. <laughs> I was a theater kid, but yeah, that was quite the schedule. 
I just think his entire like demeanor that comes across in that section mm -hmm. is, you know, the anti-democratic thing. It's I don't want the people telling me what to do. I don't want a mass of people saying what I can and cannot do, yeah. or what my company can and cannot do. Uh -huh. My company should be in charge of my company. Yeah. I just feel like he can say that because. He, I mean, he's older when he's writing this, right? And yeah, yeah. He, I, I feel like mm -hmm. he has the right to say this, being how old he is and what he's like experienced. So. Yeah, I mean, he, he's at the time he's writing, he's in his 70s. Yeah. Um, he is dying. Um, he is the most... Call a dying man, though. No. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, he, he's, and he's also, you know, he's the, you know, the most famous yes, the most Anglophone famous. poet in the world. Yeah, it's valid. That's like trying to tell, like... <laughs> Uh -huh. like Dolly Parton. No, yeah, I, I, th I think Dolly Parton is probably the evidence suggests Dolly Parton is a nicer person than yeah, Nancy yeah, Pelosi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, um, but yeah, I mean, like, sorry. Yeah, so, so yeah, so, so, so some of that arrogance is earned. Yeah, go ahead, Bree. What are you gonna say? Gonna say it seems more like I'm trying to flashback to the last government class I took, which was quite long ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say that he seems to be arguing more towards a, is an oligarchy? Or there's like a small group of higher class individuals in charge of everything. Yeah. And everyone else just has to listen. Mm -hmm. That's oligarchy. Yeah. yeah, yeah I remember yeah, yeah. something. Yeah. Was it involved mm -hmm. in English? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it is definitely a kind of totalitarian yeah. view of the world, right? And I think we get that a little bit more intensely in the second section of this, right? You know, he talks, and, 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 you know, starting on, uh, you know, on page 316 here, tomorrow's revolution. Since about 1900, the better stocks have not been replacing their numbers, while the stupider and less healthy have been more than replacing theirs. Eugenics. Yeah. Yeah, that's eugenics. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, yeah. Eugenics 101, right? Yeah. If we've learned Ooh. anything in this class, it is eugenics. I just read mm -hmm. this thing I read on the internet about. Um, <laughs> they're like putting into laws like anti abortion laws. And uh -huh. it's, or not, it's something, I don't remember like what state, but it's basically making it to where like you can get married at such a young age. And a lot of people, like, it's like them, like the, the really high class people because they're mm -hmm. not having kids so that they can marry younger girls. And get them pregnant and like have the big families again. That's that sounds a little conspiratorial. Yeah, I, I read it somewhere. Yeah. And I was like, what is going on? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I will say that historically, and I'm not taking any position on this one way or the other. Historically, um, anti-abortion laws have often been an attempt by wealthier uh, people in society to control poorer people's sexuality. Um, and you know, so th there there is often a class dimension um, to uh, abortion legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, what Yates yeah what Yates seems to be uh, anxious about here is actually something not too different from what Eliot was anxious about in the wasteland, right? A lack of fertility in the upper classes specifically his own Anglo-Irish ascendancy class, right? Leading to what he calls the stupid and degenerate taking over. Um, it's like, have any of you ever seen a movie called Idiocracy? It's on my list. Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, um, it's got uh, Luke Wilson and Maya Rudolph. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, Mike Judge, the uh, King of the Hill, Beavis and Butthead guy, uh, directed it. Um, and the basic premise of the movie is like, it's, um, it's in the not too terribly distant future, kind of like a few generations from where we are now. And the basic premise, yeah, is that wealthy, educated people stopped having children and poorly educated people had scads and scads of children. And as a result, um, you know, the world has become a kind of automated hellscape um, run by uh, corporations and ad companies um, because people are 
not smart enough to be able to think for themselves or push back or anything like that. And it was a movie that when I first saw it in my 20s, I thought was really, really funny. And that now in my 40s, I'm a little bit more bothered by some of the, um, some of the class and racial implications of it. Um, but I've, I've said, like, it's, I think it's still worth it's still a movie that's worth watching and talking about. But Yates is talking about these same kinds of things. This is the same sort of thing that he is uh, arguing against. That, that you know, the <clears throat> well, he see, he seems to want to place controls on the lower classes, right? If some financial reorganization, such as Major Douglas plans, and that better organization of agriculture and industry, which many economists expect, enable everybody without effort to procure all necessities of life and so remove the last check upon the multiplications of the uneduc uneducatable masses. It will become the duty of the educated classes to seize and control one or more of those necessities. The drilled and docile class of masses may submit, but a prolonged civil war seems more likely, with the victory of the skillful riding their machines as did the feudal knights and their armored horses. So, Let's go back here and try to apply this directly to what happens in purgatory. Right? What's the immediate cause of contention between the old man and the boy? We, already, we did already discuss this. So let's just think back to half an hour ago or so. The money. Yeah. What they're actually fighting over is that money, right? So they're actually both kind of overly attached here to this particular material substance, right? The boy thinks he deserves the money. He deserves his fair share. And the old man believes that if he gives him the money, he's not going to spend it wisely. And so it must be withheld from him. So we see here right, that conflict between the masses and the elite, right? But then, we also noted that when the old man kills the boy, it doesn't fix or change anything, right? Let's look here at the, at the end of the play. Can I get somebody um, to read for us on page 174? The, the old man's last speech, starting with study that tree. <clears throat> study that tree. It stands there like a purified soul, all cold, sweet, glistening light. Dear mother, the window is dark again, but you are in the light because I finished all that consequence. I killed that lad, for he was growing up. He would soon take some woman's fancy, beget and pass pollution on. I am a wretched, foul old man, and therefore harmless. When I have stuck this old jackknife into a sod, and pulled it out all bright again, and picked up all the money that he dropped, I'll to a distant place, and there tell my jo old jokes among new men. Okay, so let's pause here, right? So what does this speech tell us the old man thinks is gonna happen? What's his justification for what he did? He kept, oh, Go ahead. He kept the boy pure, and by doing so, he is still damned, but there are other men just like him, so he's gonna be fine, and now he has the money. Now he has the money to go. Yeah, he, he does you know, specifically mention, I'm going to pick up the money, right? But what is it like? Does everybody agree with it that that's why he, why he justifies killing the boy, that it's about keeping the boy pure? I think it's about ending a cycle. He okay. seems very stuck on what happened to his mother. Mm -hmm. The entire time he's talking about what happened to his mother, how his father mistreated her, how she lost everything. And uh huh. You know, everything that was taken from her. Mm -hmm. And, how, and is, how are his mother and father different from each other? His mother came from money and his father did not. 
Yeah, class difference, right? And that seems like he wants to stop that from happening again. He doesn't want his son to do what his father did. Mm -hmm. Yes, I killed that lad for he was growing up. He would soon take he would soon take some woman's fancy, right? Some woman's going to be attracted to him. They'll have sex. They'll reproduce and create more degenerate offspring, right? He's trying to end the cycle. Yeah, he is trying to. Yeah, go ahead, Hannah. The part where I'm getting like, like I get all that part, but the part that I'm getting lost at is when he says, "Your mother, the window is dark again, but you're in the light because I finished all that consequence." Uh huh. What? Like what is? I don't get that. He's talking about consequence at the very beginning. And it's like how, it's like in Purgatory when spirits have to relive what happened to them over and over and over again until they pay their dues. Mm -hmm. And I think he's trying to pay the dues for his mother yeah. so that which, he can finally rest in peace. Which is also what usually happens in a no ghost play. Uh, like, yeah, the ghost is typically reliving some awful experience over and over again until a monk or someone shows up to set it free. But yeah, I, I, um, but yeah, I, I, and then um, I think what we see after this, right, is that instead of, yeah, the window's dark right now, right, but it was also dark when they got there. And so he hears the hoof beats again, right, and the cycle just resets. It doesn't erase, right? Nothing new or different happens. So whatever the old man tried to do, it's ineffectual. It's just not his day. <laughs> and I don't know if it's, you know, maybe because he insists on grabbing the money, maybe because he's misread or misunderstood the problem. Because he killed his son. Yeah. Or, in the same place mm -hmm. where he killed his father with the same knife. Yeah. Or maybe just because the, the particular cycle of suffering that he's identified is, um, uh, is inevitable. That there's nothing to be done about it. We're going to stop there because we are out of time. So I'll give you the reading questions for next time. And I do think that you will probably find Orwell easier. I hope that means that you won't find as much to say about it. Because, yeah, 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 yeah. You, guys, you guys were good today. We read um, Animal Farm in high school. That's by Orwell, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I like that one. Yeah. As a small child, one of my favorite movies was Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. I've never seen the movie. Right? Yeah, there's there's an animated. Uh, there's an animated version of it, and it's so good. Like as a small child. I